Hello, my name is Preston Singletary and welcome to my presentation. Um, I am a Seattle resident and I've, I grew up here and have lived here ever since. I um, uh, continue to work and, and live here in Seattle. Uh, but I am a Tlingit tribal member from the Kaguantan clan, uh, which is uh, from the southeast of Alaska and Sitka. This was, we're said to be, my family is said to be a descendant of Catleon, who was a, um, a chief or leader in the Sitka area at the turn of the century. Um, this is my great grandmother in the center here, who um, was married just uh, in the early 1900s to a man named uh, George Bartlett, um, and her name was Susie. Johnson, Bartlett, Gubatayo. Um, so they were married and had children, um, but my great-grandfather was uh, killed in a sawmill accident in 1919. And um, so um, the, she ended up marrying this man, Dionisio Gubatayo, who was a Filipino man who had traveled around the world and ended up in Alaska for the f fishing in the canneries. Um, and they had more children uh, and uh, resided in the Seattle area till her death in 1980. And she was at least 100 years old at that time. Um, and this is my son, who is now actually 20 years old, but this kind of shows some of the symbolism and the clothing that we wear in ceremonial uh, moments uh, to signify where we come from within the tribe, clan symbols and such. Um, uh, this is my great aunt and uncle who were the children of Susie and Dionisio Gubatayo and they are half Filipino and half Clinket. And my great or my grandmother actually was full-blooded Clinket, but she also in turn married a Filipino man. So technically, I'm a Clinkapino. Um, and this is my father. So to mix it up even more, he's uh, European descent, and um, this is him doing what he loves best, uh, fishing. And you know, but I always. Uh, knew my father as a uh, creative uh, man and uh, a great outdoorsman, did a lot of mountain climbing and rock climbing and uh, skiing and always dabbling in um, different kinds of things like oil painting and uh, soapstone carving and uh, writing poetry and reading a lot. So uh, my mother as well, uh, both of them played music. They played uh, Delta blues and sang folk songs and things around me when I was a young kid. And uh, uh, But she was also involved with a lot of handicrafts, um, crocheting and macrame and sewing and all kinds of things, uh, cooking. Um, and so I always cite them as, um, um, I, you know, growing up around them, I felt like I didn't really have to limit myself to any one thing. Um, and so I've always been dabbling in lots of different activities. Um, this is my wife, Osa Sandlin, and we met in Sweden in 1993, um, and we were married in 1995 in Seattle and uh, raised our two kids in um, Seattle. Um, growing up, my only aspiration was to play music. Um, I wanted to become a professional musician and dabbled in uh, you know, playing in different bands over the years and that was something that really kind of fueled my creativity as well. And I'll talk more about that later um, with my most current band. 
But so I grew up with this guy, Dante Marioni, and here we are pictured with Lino Tagliapietra. Uh, we're up at the Pilchuck School working with him um, and developed a really close friendship with Lino. And he taught us a lot about, um, you know, Italian uh, approaches to glass blowing, uh, which really, um, you know, Lino's traveled the world and taught many, many people, and we've all benefited greatly from being able or having worked with him. Um, and, you know, glass blowing is about teamwork, and so I found that this was something. You know, I, I didn't uh, I didn't go to school um, after high school. I didn't go to college, so I fell right into glass blowing. But at that time, it, there wasn't a lot of um, people doing it. And this was in the the early 80s, and so I found myself in this um, with this opportunity working with lots of great artists and just training through practical experience and working with people. Um, so eventually I, I figured out how to conjoin my skills with glass blowing and glass making um, with uh, my Clinket tribal style. And for me, I always like to say that it awaken this genetic memory that I, I keep tapping into. And so a little bit of um, uh, discussion about the the objects that I make that um, are inspired by, by uh, traditional forms. And so this was a hat that was typically made out of um, uh, spruce root and woven. And then I made it as a glass bowl, an object, and and started to carve these designs into the glass. And, uh, and then at some point discovered that there was this shadow effect that was really kind of um, interesting and special. And um, for me, it's become sort of like a, a spirit within the piece that is revealed when the lighting is just right. So these um, shadows kind of um, I, in my mind kind of uh, have a spiritual quality to them um, and so over the years as my skills have evolved um, I'm looking at traditional objects and trying to mimic them in glass and do the traditional carvings and um, kinds of uh, objects that were uh, made for use, and these are some canoe paddles. So this is my version of a canoe paddle uh, in full scale. This is um, uh, a full-sized canoe paddle. It has a carving into it. Um, masks were a, a really important component of the cultural objects and were used for sto storytelling. And so... Um, and killer whale happens to be my crest symbol, so this is a killer whale ancestral mask. Um, and uh, so that's this is where I'm looking for inspiration in the kinds of objects that I was making or I've been making over the years. And this is a helmet, actually a war helmet, and so this is kind of my you know interpretation of a form like that. This is based on a wolf, uh, uh, a wolf helmet, uh, and then the rattles are also used for ceremonial uh, purposes, and these uh, are some of the most finely carved pieces that that are that exist on the northwest coast, and so. Making that shape for me has always been a real challenge and trying to bring those traditional kinds of details into the, uh, the glass sculpture. Um, more examples of rattles and this is a real scattershot of like as my skills have evolved over the years what I'm able to achieve in the form of sculpting you know, freehand sculpting and some cases using 
a mold to get you know some, some details um, into the piece. This is a soul catcher. This is a shaman's amulet, and this is my version of uh, a soul catcher. Um, and yeah, to me, this kind of also references the spirituality of the um, the clinket community. Uh, this was used as a healing implement uh, by a shaman. And uh, this is David Svensson, who became sort of my first mentor. Um, we met at the Pilchuck Glass School and developed a friendship in the late 90s and, uh, um, or, I'm sorry, the late 80s, actually. And then by 2000, um, or just before the, the in, yeah, in around 2000, we um, talked to the Pilchuck Glass School where we met about making a totem pole for the school that would tell the story of, you know, the origins of the school. Um, and so <clears throat> this was to commemorate the, uh, the 30th anniversary uh, of the school being in existence. And so we, uh, David worked on this totem pole up in Haines, Alaska with, um, at the Alaska Indian Arts Studio in Haines, Alaska. And uh, so we carved it mostly up in Haines and then s sent it down to the school where we continued working on it um, as a class. And so we had several um, tribal members from different tribes around the country um, involved. And then we had the, the carvers from Alaska come down uh, to the school and work with us on finishing the piece. And this is my one contribution to that particular uh, object. This totem pole is a hat that was going to be on the top of the pole. Um, and so this is Dale Chihuly. Um, that's how we represented him with this, you know, sort of glass insert um, uh, in place of a, an eye patch. Um, and this <clears throat> is a wolf uh, shakiette. This was um, uh, in honor of John Hauberg, who was one of the founders of the school. Um, he repatriated this ceremonial dagger to a family up in Angoon. So John was a passionate Northwest Coast art collector, and his you know, uh, collection resides at the Seattle Art Museum. This one piece, he couldn't determine the provenance of it, so he he did some research and re repatriated it to the Jacob family in Angoon, and as a result was given a clinket name, uh, Gooch Kiates, which means dark wolf. Um, so after about three weeks, you know, working on this pole and making some glass elements that were going to be inlaid into the pole, we had the elders from Klukwan, which is a village outside of Haines, um, to come and officiate, officiate the uh, um, the installation ceremony. Uh, so as a school, we all came together and carried the totem pole from its um, workstation by the, the glass shop here. Um, this was uh, an amazing uh, event for me because it was almost like a, a rite of passage, you know, having the glass studio there and and working with glass and you know introducing other native people to the process of glass making and then working on the totem pole there um, next to the hot shop here we're putting the um, uh, the hat on top of the totem pole <laughs> little uh, out of sequence slide here um, this was supposed to be the first one. But anyway, here's the uh, totem pole in its completion. And the top figure is Annie Halberg, who was um, uh, John's wife at the time, and she was the other patron of the school. The two of them and Dale Chihuly are featured here on the, on the uh, totem pole. So this is, um, you know, since David Svensson is a neon artist as well, he 
Um, he uh, brought some neon details into the totem pole and we're, we're uh, illuminating these glass sculpt, uh, these glass components um, with uh, neon to emulate sort of uh, abalone effect, the way that kind of catches the iridescence um, or the northern lights of Alaska. Um, so during this time of COVID, um, I'm starting to sh share with people some some thoughts that I have about um, you know what kind of brought me to do what I do today. <clears throat> you know, I wasn't raised with any religious instruction, and so um, but I did read these books, the Carlos Castaneda books in um, high school, which was a big trendy thing to do, and um, you know, it, it kind of sparked my imagination towards the supernatural and, and, and spiritual things, even though a lot of his writings were, um, you know, sort of fabricated to some degree. But there is something in that, in those books that are, were, for me, were quite interesting, like the whole idea of navigating within your dream time. And um, if while you were sleeping, if you could identify your hand and look at your hand and start to look at the periphery beyond your hand that you'd be able to navigate in your dream time. And I thought that was really fascinating. It led me to read a little bit about um, Jung psychology um, because he was one of the pioneers in, of dream analysis um, and uh, was really fascinated with the Native American vision quest. And so um, this is all stuff that kind of feeds into my idea of spirituality. Um, also, Aikido was a martial art that I trained with for several years. And there's a lot of Buddhist philosophy in that activity. And it's sort of very interesting sort of physical um, uh, meditation, um, a moving meditation. And so these are things that are all kind of a confluence of influences for me, um, things that I, I think about uh, all the time and inform my work to some degree. And of course, there is uh, Joseph Campbell, uh, who um, did a lot of comparative mythology, which is also a huge inspiration for me. Um, and then Joe David here is um, a guy that I met in the summer of 2000, and we were up at the Pilchuck Glass School. Um, I was helping him learn about the process of glass blowing, and he basically introduced me to the sweat lodge ceremony. This was um, a, uh, an activity that we did on the campus um, up at Pilchuck. Um, and this was uh, kind of my first introduction to native spirituality, which for me, I felt like I was ripe for. Um, and, it, and it did give me a lot of, um, you know, inspiration and, you know, uh, constituted in a lot of personal growth, I believe. And, you know, my connection with Joe, um, he helped me a lot understand, you know, the, uh, the culture and the art form. So he's a respected uh, elder and carver from the Nuchanuth uh, tribe. Uh, and that's the, from the west coast of Vancouver Island. And at the end of the session, um, he after four sweats, which are like four or five hour ceremonies, we, he, he adopted me and he shared his name with me. Um, and he bestowed that name upon me, which is in, interesting because in the context of Northwest Coast culture, you can receive different names throughout your lifetime, which would signify a change or a shift in your, you know, in your, life and so that's what that meant for me a piece that uh, joe made this is a, a wolf skull 
And so for me, this, this really, uh, this, this gave me a lot of um, power and momentum uh, because of, of, of how he, you know, kind of brought me into the fold. And um, so this was a piece that I made called Teacher and Apprentice, and it was um, kind of talking about the namesake, um, Kakawan Chief, which is a transforming killer whale. Um, and uh, so that is one of my mentors. And... The next guy that I wanted to talk about was Walter Porter, who um, was a man from Yakutat, and he, um, we met in 2004 at the opening of the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., where uh, huge numbers of, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, indigenous people from North America came to, um, uh, to that event and I met Walter then and he had seen my work and he was really fascinated with my um, idea of working with raven you know the raven imagery with the sun in its beak um, and I talked to him about this idea eventually this was you know 10 years later but we we I wanted to um, make an exhibition and work with Walter. Unfortunately, he passed away before we had time to, uh, to, to actually realize this exhibition together. Um, and so I had was, uh, I turned to another curator and another Clinkett and Zuni, uh, woman named Miranda Bellardi Lewis. And I asked her to help me uh, curate this exhibition, which uh, originated at the Museum of Glass and is currently at uh, the Wichita Art Museum, uh, and will go to the Smithsonian eventually, as well as the um, the Chrysler Museum in Norfolk, Virginia. So, in any case, uh, this is uh, a story of Raven and the Box of Daylight, uh, and this was Raven. In the beginning of time, when the world was in darkness, and Raven at that time was a white bird, um, and he goes to the fisherman of the night, and he asks, where is the daylight? And so I'm showing you the, the chronology of how you would experience this exhibition. Um, and he's told of an old man who lives at the head of the Nas River, who has the daylight in his clan house. Um, and he's told of the old man's daughter who um, lives with him. And uh, it just so happens that part of the story, um, the, the woman or the young daughter is transparent. And so that signifies a supernatural being in the same way that the white raven also signifies a supernatural animal. Um, so he goes to the old man and asks to come and see his treasures and the old man denies him access to the house. And so, uh, Raven devises this plan. He transforms himself into a speck of dirt. And when the daughter goes out in the morning to drink water from this stream, um, she, uh, is with her attendants and the attendants decide to check the, the, the purity of the water and they run a feather through the water and they discover this dirt and so they cast out the water. Um, so Raven goes back and reformulates his plan and this time he decides to transform himself into a hemlock needle. So this mobile is sort of spinning, moving, you know, very gently in this room and um, the uh, so this is Raven deconstructing himself and turning into this little hemlock needle. He floats down the river or this stream, and this time when uh, the daughter scoops up the water, they don't see it, and she she swallows the water and also swallows the hemlock needle. Well, this is actually Raven now who is inside her, and she realizes that she had swallowed something, um, and so she becomes pregnant. And so part of the details of the story is that uh, 
uh, you know, she's, you know, so first of all, she has no husband, so, but nobody really seems to question that, but um, she becomes pregnant, and she's, it comes time to give birth, and uh, in the old days, what they would do is dig a little pit out and back behind the clan house, and they would line it with furs, and then the baby would be born on these furs. And she's having trouble giving birth, and so a medicine woman comes by and says, oh, you should, um, you should change it to uh, moss, take the furs out. The baby doesn't want to be born on these furs, so they put um, moss out into this little pit, and, uh, and then the child is born. So this is Raven inside of her sort of transforming into a human child. Um, and then this, you know, when she finally does give birth, she give, gives birth to Raven in the form of a human child. And so uh, this is illustrating kind of the transformation of Raven um, transforming into a human. And this is also animated with, with um, kind of motion and lights or like a, a image that's projected onto the, this little hat form. And so this is how Raven eventually gets in to, in, into the clan house. So this is the, the old man kind of presiding over his treasures, um, his precious objects. Um, and uh, so the child grows really quickly. And, you know, the old man is really excited to have a grandchild. And, but he's very precocious and very mischievous, and he's always poking around, looking for things, and he comes across these boxes. And um, one by one, you know, he, op you know, he's playing with this first box, and it's the box that contains the stars. And uh, when no one's looking, he opens up the box and he tosses the stars into the sky, where they remain today. Um, you know, each time. Uh, so a couple of days later, he, he finds the next box. It's the box that contains the moon. And, uh, and you know, he's told, you know, don't open the box uh, by the grandfather. Uh, but so he kind of bides his time. And finally, he does open the box. And he takes the, the, the moon. And he tosses it through the smoke hole in the, the clan house. And it uh, ends up in the sky again in the in the black sky and um so this time you know the old man's pretty you know disappointed and you know scolds him and um so when the child finds the third box you know the old man's like okay don't open the box you know and so the little child starts to you know cry and cry and wail and you know uh he stops eating, he becomes weak, and, and, you know, he's pretty much driving everybody crazy at this point. And um, then the, uh, the daughter goes to the father and says, you know, is there anything that's more important than your grandson? And, you know, the old man realizes, of course, he's right. And so he lets the child play with uh, the third box that contains the son. And... Um, you know, maybe knowing what was going to happen, but, you know, not uh, not really happy about it. So he, the child finally opens up the box and decides to transform himself back into a bird. And the old man realizes uh, that he's been fooled and he grabs the raven by its tail and he's, you know, flapping away, trying to get away. And uh, um, uh, he directs him over... The fire in the the, the central uh, you know the central fire pit in the clan house and the soot from the flames uh, is what turns Raven black and so that's how Raven became a black bird um, and so the uh, he flies through this the smoke hole in the clan house he breaks daylight on the world and the people in the world, um, some of them, you know, were, they were startled and they jumped up into the air and they became the birds. Um, some of them ran off into the forest and they became the forest animals. Um, and then some of them uh, jumped into the water and they became the sea life. 
and the people that remained where they are today became the human beings or the Tlingit people. And so that's how um, one theory of how these animals were eventually adopted into clan symbols and representing different families. And um, and a little bit about modernism, um, which is another kind of uh, inspiration for me. It was I was I was since I didn't go to art school, I was left to kind of uh, research and uh, learn about art on my own and something about the surrealist again with the um, that that came up and I read things about them that they they held Northwest Coast art in high regard because it was kind of you know abstractions and symbolisms and things like this and so it caused me to look at modernism in different ways and there was a a um, there was a a writer native writer named Renard Strickland who who said um, uh, it's he wrote that it's ironic that the modernists forced us to look at um, the primitive and appreciate differing levels of reality. And because the modernists were so enamored with um, art from these these old cultures, you know, such as uh, oceanic cultures, native cultures, and and African cultures, um, they. Uh, they were looking at this for inspiration. And in some cases, you can kind of see how it was quite, um, you know, almost, you know, appropriated in some cases. The Picassos and the, these African helmets. Um, and uh, then, um, so I started to look at those kinds of things um, and try to become inspired by them. Now, this is a Brancusi. And this was my, you know, little take at um, kind of turning the tables on the modernists and using their work as inspiration to create abstractions within the context of my work. <clears throat> and then, so this is a eagle raven. Um, you know, if you look at the top edge or top side of that sculpture, it's the eagle beak. And if you look at, you know, the bottom side, that's kind of the raven side. So there's a duality there. Um, this is the origin of mosquitoes. This is how this man here uh, had to um, stalk this cannibal giant. And, and, and because it was taking young children and um, uh, from the villages, and so he stalks it. He decides he's going to, you know, he's going to kill it um, and rid the community of this uh, monster. And just, he decided that he was really going to do away with it. And so he uh, burned the carcass of this this beast after he killed it. But then the embers off the body, the you know, they transformed into mosquitoes, and they're still trying to eat us today. Um, these, this is, I call this hyacinth medicine amulet. This was, um, uh, you know, an honor again of like Joe David, whose, um, middle name is hyacinth. Um, and, uh, so playing with, you know, some, you know, these spare, simple forms or these more organic forms and then ornamenting it with Northwest coast art in my mind was kind of, you know, being inspired by the modernist uh, sensibility. Um, you know, this is a mussel shell. And this is a little bit like a Brancusi uh, form that I was inspired by. Had this, you know, hole in it and this little prunt that was kind of protruding out of it. Um, and, uh, uh, and then kind of playing with... Um, different sculptural forms that, um, um, you know, sometimes in uh, Northwest Coast print, you might see um, only certain elements that are kind of uh, in the design that notate, you know, a fin or a, a pectoral fin or the head or the tail or whatever. So this was my way of kind of playing with that abstraction of the 
uh, two-dimensional design in a three-dimensional form. Um, this is called Volcano Woman. Um, and then this one is really just like um, a very inspired by kind of a rattle form, but um, again, just playing with the, these elements of design, which really make it Northwest Coast art, how these elements work together in a very kind of puzzle-like fashion. Um, these are some of the monumental works that I've done. This is a, one of the first big pieces I did for the Seattle Art Museum. This was called Keat Shagoon, which was a killer whale screen. And this was about, oh, seven by five feet tall and is uh, based on a um, heraldic screen that would be uh, within the interior of a clan house. Um, and uh, and then this was a, a commission that I was uh, given for a cultural arts center in Alaska, um, sort of my home community. Um, these forms were uh, based on house posts, which were, you know, decorative carvings that would ornament and cover up the support beams within the 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 clan house. Um, this is the final installation, which kind of resembles the interior of a clan house. Um, and this is a gathering space in this cultural arts center where a lot of um, storytelling and meetings and gatherings happen. Um, this was a piece called Symbolic Wealth. This is based on a Tana piece or a copper uh, which denotes the status, the high status of a of an individual. This is that piece that's installed into a private home, which is backlit with um, lights um, that can be brightened or dimmed. Um, again, the canoe paddles, uh, kind of working with more larger kiln cast forms, and all of these pieces are actually kiln formed rather than blown, which is typical of my work. Um, and then sometimes I have to go back to uh, Dave's coffee shop to work on, on larger pieces. Uh, this is a, a full-scale totem that I designed and David carved for me um, in wood. Since I'm not a wood carver, I work collaboratively with carvers to make these pieces. And I commissioned him and designed and worked on this um, piece which is represents my great grandmother and she had a pet grizzly bear as a child um, and so this is the grizzly bear it's telling a story which is by tradition what totem poles actually do they're supposed to tell a story um, and so this is um, the uh, story of my great grandmother and this is how we, um, we this was cast in uh, solid glass, it weighs about 2,000 pounds, and it was uh, made in the Czech Republic. So I work with the artists in the Czech Republic because they're well versed at making these large castings, which are very, very, um, uh, and, you know, it's the point at which the art ends and the science kind of begins uh, as far as melting this much glass and making it uh, solid and, um, uh, and, and uh, you know, there, there's uh, the cooling process on such a large piece is very, very tricky because um, if it's cooled too fast, um, it will fracture and break. And so uh, these guys have a lot of experience doing this kind of thing. So here we're installing a couple of the sections onto that, uh, uh, into this home. And there's the top section with the, uh, the grizzly bear cub. And here it is kind of in, in not completely finished, but um, we're uh, nearly done with the installation process. And this was the second uh, large scale totem that I've been working on. Um, this is a plastic model, as you can see. But this is the finished piece. This is something that is um, uh, uh, this piece is actually 2,800 pounds of glass, and this one is just newly completed. 
Um, and this is my team that works with me, has been working with me for close to 15 years, um, helping me uh, make my all of my work, every aspect of it. Um, and this is my studio a few years back before it got cluttered with more and more stuff. But um, so these are the folks that help me. This is some of the ways that I get the designs into the glass. This is um, the, a rubber stencil that is put onto the surface, and then I'll draw the designs onto the onto the stencil, and then I'll have my assistant here, Brittany, um, cut out the stencil and expose the areas that will be carved. Um, and this is Terry. She's doing um, a kind of elaborate process that create that creates um, the ability to carve this texture into the glass and make it look like basketry. So this is Maurice is an old uh, friend of mine that um, I've worked with for many, many years and played music with and all kinds of uh, art projects together. Um, and so back to the music, um, this is a group that I had called Little Big Band uh, about a mm, little over 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, and I wanted to blend uh, native culture with uh, contemporary music, or actually funk jazz music, funk rock styles. Um, and so I brought some of my, you know, tribal members uh, together for um, for doing some, you know, performance art and spoken word storytelling, and that type of thing, uh, blended with uh, the music. And so this was one group that I ran for for several um, years. Um, this is Swell Canem, the Lummi tribal member, and then the great James Luna, who uh, passed away, but he uh, brought a lot of flavor to the group at that time, and we did a lot of fun kind of performance um, art uh, components to the group. Um, but then, uh, about 2013, um, I met this guy, Bernie Worrell, who was the co-founder of Parliament Funkadelic, and so he was a um, uh, the keyboard player and band director for that group, and he uh, and I met in the summer of 2013 when I turned 50 years old, and um, I told him about my band, and uh, so he came out to play. I paid into a Kickstarter campaign, and he came out and played my birthday, my 50th birthday party. And so I made his acquaintance then, and I showed him my studio, showed him my work, and um, and then my band, Little Big Band, got to open up for his band, the Bernie Worrell Orchestra, and um, and so we became friends. And as we were parting ways um, uh, after this performance, you know, we did one night we did a party, and the next night we did a pub. He performed with his group. Um, and uh, so, but he, as in parting ways, he said, you know, I've been thinking about your work and or your music, and we need to we need to get together and work on some some music together. And so, I was pretty blown away that you know he had an interest in working with me. So I I took him up on that, and by December of 2013, we came together and we started. Uh, recording music for a period of about three years, actually, um, till he died in 2016. Um, but so we came up with um, several multi-disc um, LPs. Uh, and each time we're sort of working with, again, storytelling and taking that to new levels. Um, also working with language preservation and, you know, uh, uh, composing songs uh, in Tlingit, Haida, and uh, Yupik on on the most recent album coming up. Actually, we have a fourth album, triple LP this time. Um, and uh, this this one here was called 
heen, which means uh, water in the Clinkin language. So that's what unifies the album. All the songs uh, have references to water, um, which was very poignant and timely because that was the, the time of the uh, Dakota Pipeline uh, protests. And so we, we did some you know, politically outspoken pieces for this particular album. But so it is to say that, you know, we just had an amazing time working with Bernie uh, in the studio. You know, it resulted in all this m music. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is Garrick. He's a good friend of mine from Seattle, very avant-garde saxophone player and composer, artist in his own right. And Stanton Moore, who's a, a funk jazz drummer from uh, New Orleans, um, came up and played on the first two albums. Um, Captain Rob is a, a Blackfoot um, a tribal member. Um, so, and uh, Clarissa Rizal, who was uh, another very important mentor to me, who passed away in 2016, same year as Bernie. We lost two uh, members at that time in that year. And so that was pretty devastating. But uh, we persevere. We've got a new keyboard player. We've got a new drummer because Stanton can't uh, be, uh, he can't uh, be in the Seattle area all the time. So um, we have um, figured out a way to keep uh, the band going in a new direction. Uh, this is our fourth and final album that will be coming out in the hopefully after the first of the year and and so that's it i hope uh you all enjoyed the presentation and here's our ways to uh keep tabs on the work that i'm doing and find out more about the music or um, um uh, anything that you might want to know so Anyway, thanks for tuning in, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks.